In 1573, one year after closing the Oprichnina, his reign of terror in Russia, Ivan the Terrible, Ivan Grozny, wrote to the abbot of the Belouzero Monastery. He wrote, Alas for me, a sinner, woe to me in my despair. O oh, me, in my foulness, it behoves you, our masters, to illuminate us, who have lost our way in the darkness of pride, who are mired in sinful vanity, gluttony, and intemperance. And I, a stinking hound, whom can I teach? What can I preach? And with what can I enlighten others? Myself always wallowing in drunkenness, fornication, adultery, filth, murders, rapine, or despoliation, hatred, and all sorts of evil doing. Even Ivan the Terrible found it hard to separate out who he really was from the myth of violence and horror that he had created for himself. Welcome to the Burning Archive. This is part two of the Burning Archive where we're exploring the extraordinary life, the dramatic life, the violent, but um, not only violent life, the very repentant life at times of Ivan the Fourth, Tsar of Russia, Ivan the Terrible. And in part one, I sort of explain some of the key uh, memes, I guess, in the history of all the, the historiography of Ivan the Terrible, as well as gave a bit of a narrative account of his life, his extraordinary life, becoming Grand Prince of Muscovy and many other uh, Russian territories in at the age of three, being mistreated as a child, going on for at least 10 or 15 years of what seemed to be an era of policy reform before descending into the dark terror of the Oprichnina and then the last years of repentance, regret and uh, disorder as signified by that quote with which we started the show which of course comes from the great biography of Ivan the Terrible by Isabella de Madariaga quoting an actual letter to Abbot Cosma of a Beluzero uh, monastery in 1573. Uh, and in this episode, uh, we are going to try to separate Ivan, uh, the man, the Tsar and the myth, and um, see if it's possible to find some coherent explanation for all that madness and all that violence, or whether, indeed, uh, Ivan just does not represent one of those, I guess, test cases in history that just show you how uh, some aspects of history and of life are just, you just have to accept the uh, many-voiced character and the many-sided drama of his life and the fact that truth really is stranger than fiction and a reality stranger than history itself. And of course all of this is also in the service of trying to uh, recover from the black legend of Russian history and Ivan the Terrible, of course. Uh, in those accounts very much represents the essence of autocracy in the terror state. And, well, I mean, there is some pretty clear evidence of his reign inflicting horrible, horrible terror on the population. Uh, but whether his reign is emblematic, a symbolic... Uh, representative of the, the quintessence of Russia's dark temptation of autocracy? That is a different question. And of course, he looms over Russian history. Ivan looms over Russian history as both a shadow and an enigma. His sheer strangeness, the difficulty of really knowing anything about his life and rule with 
very much certainty the 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 uh, difficulty of explaining his character his ideas his actions and uh, some of the institutions he established is just um, what makes him intriguing but also what makes him a uh, enduring and unique symbol perhaps of Russian history and so to do all of that uh, I'm going to look at five key themes so uh, that you know relate to that that image of Ivan uh, how he exercised power um, his violence uh, the nature of his mind or his psyche and his uh, deep repentance and leading to his death and finally the legacy he has left Russia if indeed all the 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 uh, legacy of symbols and stories that he has left Russia okay so let's get into each of those themes and I guess I should probably also say my name's Jeff Rich and I'm a, a author and a podcaster uh, you, I'm also as well as producing this audio podcast now I'm putting uh, many of these podcasts in video format on uh, the Burning Archive YouTube channel so do check that out and you can also support me by buying my newly released book from the Burning Archive which uh, includes my essays and uh, various fragments posted initially on the Burning Archive uh, website over the last five or seven years and uh, included in that uh, book is a couple of essays on the subject of this podcast Ivan the Terrible so uh, do check that out and I'd love it if you did uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and see if I can get up to the magical number of 1000 subscribers in order to uh, monetize the channel okay enough advertising let's get in to the story okay so we're going to talk more thematically about Ivan the Terrible's life today get into some of the details and look at power violence his mind his disordered mind his repentance leading to his death and finally his legacy and pull out some of the more fascinating stories and debates about what it all meant okay let's start off with power so the historian Nancy Coleman or Nancy Shields Coleman I think it might be uh, describes Ivan the Terrible as a symbol of the wantonness wantonness of unrestricted power and that is very much his 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 function I guess is one of the great evil autocrats in uh, history uh, but that symbol is also very much something which relates I guess to the black legend of Russian history uh, Russia itself has become a symbol of the wantonness of the unrestricted power of its uh, dark autocrats or stretching back to Ivan the Terrible through Peter the Great, uh, Nicholas the First, Stalin, Lenin, and of course Vladimir Putin. And uh, in a way, the story goes back all the way to one of the very first Western diplomatic reporters on Russia, uh, Sigismund von Herbert Stein, who as representative of the Holy Roman Empire visited Russia in the early 16th century and described the way in which uh, the, uh, the Tsar or the Grand Prince, the monarch of Russia, exercised more power as an individual than any other monarch in Europe and indeed that the aristocrats of 
uh, the court, the boyars of the court, were happy to call themselves slaves to this autocrat. And I guess uh, Herbert Stein was the first in many Western diplomats who who kind of misunderstood the politics of the Russian uh, state. In fact, it was a much more complicated situation, and I guess we talked about that a little bit in the first episode. There were all sorts of social tensions. There was a complex reliance on uh, consensus between the uh, Tsar and the uh, the boyars or the leading aristocrats and the leading advisors and of course there was also the very very significant role of the church itself uh the orthodox church in indeed um it was there has been a very strong uh, i guess uh, a revisionist idea in russian history um, put forward, I think, by Nancy Coleman and others, Robert Crummy, maybe, um, that talked about how the Tsar might have talked a big game in terms of his absolute power, but he really was not so much in control, that there were very, very much a very strong reliance on uh, the, the, the boyars, um, and I guess like any any political power situation, the leader often seems to be in total charge, but uh, the leader has always got problems controlling the barons. Um, uh, it's the classic political authority problem. Uh, you can't do something in government without sharing power to some degree and once you share power and competence to do things with others then they naturally want to have a bit of control over their own domain so just as in other states so in russia there was a much more complicated complicated a uh, set of relationships between the Tsar, between Ivan the Terrible and his boyars. It may not have quite been as extreme as some of the revisionist arguments say that there was only a facade of autocracy, that all the ceremony, all the talk that Herbert Stein heard about uh, the boyars being happy to be slaves and the, the Tsar exercising untrammeled dominion and unrestricted power or was uh, merely ceremony and PR designed for foreign uh, representatives and ambassadors but there was certainly a lot of tension and as we discussed in or as I discussed in the first episode Sergei Bogatyrov really bases his interpretation of Ivan the Terrible's uh, rule in terms of the uh, attempt to consolidate power and consolidate the state just as it was being consolidate, consolidated and built in other uh, Eurasian states during the 16th century uh, against these significant uh, internal social tensions. And so, and and this is also where Ivan's, I guess, record of reform comes in. And it's part of the dilemma of interpreting Ivan's life, that uh, there's the good years and then there's the bad years. And how do you actually uh, find an explanation that can bridge them in some way? But broadly, the uh, kind of reforms that Ivan uh, implemented were all uh, of this nature of building and strengthening the state. He brought a lot more consistency and order to the church and to the moral rules of the church and also to the court. Uh, in some ways it wasn't quite a reformation but you know this was 50 years after both the reformation and as part of if you think if you think of like the Jesuits were getting 
um, set up in these years, uh, the counter-reformations occurring in uh, Western Europe, and in some senses there's some similar kinds of religious and moral reforms going on within the Orthodox Church, which uh, Ivan plays a key role in leading a czar. Exactly how he led it, um, it's just impossible to know now. Similarly, he strengthened the army. He, uh, you know, changed some of the military technologies and tactics. He established the uh, Streltsy, the sort of musketeer type uh, people, and adapted some of the military t tactics and uh, organization of the military to uh, both support his wars, uh, which were both against the kind of uh, Central European powers, Poland, Lithuania, but also very much so against the sort of Tatar Golden Horde groups in the south of Russia, Kazan, Astrakhan, going down into the Crimea. The Crimean Tatars, after all, raided and burnt Moscow in 1571. And then uh, thirdly, he also implemented a whole series of reforms to the sort of royal administration, the, the, the state administration, making it more efficient and less corrupt. And indeed, moving away from a kind of medieval dynastic court to a bit more of an organized state. So some of the first kind of real bureaucratic departments, uh, prikazi in Russian, were established in the uh, 1550s in this period of Russia's, uh, of Ivan the Terrible's good years. And similarly, he also uh, establishes or strengthens various forms of local government, local administration. And this was particularly to deal with problems of banditry and, uh, you know, the sort of lawless wild south, wild west uh, in the south of Russia that uh, I think became a real problem in the time of Troubles, but uh, Ivan was also setting up changed arrangements and changed roles for some of the leading dignitaries or, or, or the leading uh, aristocrats, ba barons, boyers and other key officials to try to uh, reduce the level of social banditry, raiding from the Tatars, um, general sort of lawlessness in the outer reaches of the Russian state. So all that's sort of happening, but it, uh, Ivan is also very much driven, uh, not just by sort of rational, if you like, uh, well, no, but he's also driven by some other, other ideas of how to exercise power. And I'll just mention a few of those. So one is there is definitely a very significant uh, legacy of the sort of Golden Horde and Mongol uh, institutions, uh, Mongol Turkic uh, sort of institutions, uh, the Khanates, on how political power is operated in Moscow. And some people have even interpreted the Oprichnina as, if you like, him setting up a his own sort of little um, band, his own little sort of carnate within the state with his own sort of loyal followers. And I'll talk a bit more about the legacy of the sort of Mongol Golden Horde institutions in actual next week's show. But um, I think I mentioned in the narrative overview the very uh, curious uh, thing about Ivan's uh, abdication in favour of Simeon Bekulabatovich, uh, the who was a Tatar prince. So uh, that's it's it, 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 one needs to read the history of the development of Russian political institutions, not only as the sort of uh, 
uh, adoption of Western European models, but the uh, complex development or uh, uh, complex adaptation of multiple institutions, including the legacy of the, uh, the Golden Horde. And similarly, there is also a very strong legacy of both orthodox religious thinking and to some degree uh, the Byzantine Byzantine political thinking, as in the Byzantine Empire, uh, which, you know, only ended in 1453 and which there was some level of thinking that Russia was a successor state to. There's also a very strong uh, focus on the symphony of church and state in this thinking and this this uh, focus on ensuring harmony and unanimity rather than instability and intra-elite competition was one of the sort of ideas bubbling around in Ivan's head in his exercise of power and arguably part of what was seen as how he worked well in his early years was the way in which he enacted that in his positive relationship with some key advisors and the metropolitan Macquarie whereas in later years it all fell apart and Ivan was at war with the heads of the church including metropolitan Philip who resisted him as a uh, as a as a, a ruler who had gone bad and then finally he had a very particular idea of sovereignty uh, which in some ways perhaps was not so uh, out of the ballpark of concepts of the divine right of kings that was uh, articulated very strongly in Europe, in Western Europe, including in good old England in the uh, uh, 16th, 17th centuries. But Ivan uh, mixed this idea of a sovereignty and unrestricted power uh, with his own sort of personal dilemmas. And for him, of course, it, if he had that strong sense that he was an autocrat and his proper exercise of power was to do it without any resistance from others, then uh, all the complex negotiations that uh, and uh, complex levels of agreement that... Um, all the politics he would have had to deal with, with the boyars and with the church, would have infuriated him. And perhaps uh, the Oprichnina was the world's greatest uh, uh, temper tantrum. Okay, so that's some of the things about Ivan and power. So he's a symbol of unrestricted power, but we know in reality he was not able to exercise unrestricted power, even though he seemed to articulate a very peculiar personal philosophy of sovereignty and unrestricted power. And the sheer tension in his mind around that perhaps uh, exploded in some of the strange events of his power, uh, his... He, he was able to hold it together for some time, but ultimately it all cracked. Uh, perhaps things always really do fall apart in the end. Okay, so the next theme is violence and terror. And uh, look, there's just no, no sugarcoating this. Uh, Ivan participated in spectacular violence and spectacular not just in a, a, a word inflation sense but in the sense of genuine he created spectacles of violence and whether that was to enact some personal psychodrama or whether it was to implement a, a revenge and the judgment of God or whether it was to strike terror in the hearts of his uh, terror and loyalty and 
obedience in the uh, hearts of his citizens and uh, lords and followers. Uh, that is, I guess, what all the debate is. But let's just, uh, I mean, I spoke last time about the massacres in Novgorod and his humiliation of Archbishop Pyman, but there was another infamous uh, event which also which occurred soon afterwards in 1570 where uh, Ivan brought a whole bunch of princely families, leading boyer families, leading officials or diarchy in charge of the various uh, um, government administration and some of the key figures in the Oprichnina itself, uh, Prince uh, Vyazemsky and the Basmanovs to his sense of violent justice. And if I just read a little bit about this extraordinary scene from uh, Isabella Dariaga, uh, the final scene was dramatically enacted on 25th of July 1570 on the feast day of J St. James the Apostle. Ivers Ivan's executioners prepared the public square in Moscow, the Pognaya Meadow, with 20 huge stakes driven into the ground, joined by transverse beams and supplied with cauldrons of cold and boiling water. The Tsar then appeared on horseback, dressed all in black, fully armed and carrying a bow and arrows and an axe, and escorted by 1,500 mounted streltsy, or musketeers. Schlichting, who was an eyewitness, uh, as, uh, described how some 300 nobles in various stages of disintegration, prostration and decrepitude, crawling on their broken legs, were brought before Ivan and his 16-year-old son, Zarevich Ivan Ivanovich. Seeing the people were frightened and unwilling to behold a scene of such dreadful cruelty, wrote Schlichting. And here, uh, Medariag quotes Schlichting, who was like a uh, uh, like a military official, mercenary, who worked uh, over there, and wrote an account of what he saw. Ivan rode about on his horse, telling them not to be afraid and ordering them to draw near to witness the spectacle. He admitted that he had originally intended to destroy all the inhabitants of the city, but declared now that he had laid aside his anger. Whereupon the people came close to the prince, who asked whether it was right for him to punish those who had betrayed him. The people shouted, long live our glorious Tsar, and expressed their approval. The Tsar now had 184 of the 300 brought forward and gave them into the custody of nobles who were standing by, saying, here, you can have them. I make you a present of them. I have no further quarrel with them. But then uh, he brought forward the leading uh, figure, Viscavati, who had been, um, until very recently, negotiating with the Lithuanian state, uh, the, the, you know, who Ivan was at war with uh, as his key diplomat, one of his key figures. And he was accused of intriguing with the Ottoman Turks and the Khan of Crimea. As uh, each charge was read out, one of Ivan's... Ivan's uh, executioners struck Viscabati on the head with a stick or whip. Uh, the executioners tried to persuade Viscabati to admit his crimes and beg for mercy, but he denied his guilt and loudly put himself in the hands of God, who would judge both Ivan and himself in the next world. You lust to shed my blood. Go ahead and drink your fill of the blood of an innocent man. Accursed be you, bloodsuckers, and your czar were his last words. Strung up between the stakes, Viscavati was cut to pieces. Maluta Skuratov, Skuratov cut off his nose, another cut off his ears, and at last another named Ivan Rutov cut off his privy parts, whereupon he died. But Ivan, suspecting that Rutov had done this out of pity to hasten 
He's deaf, shouted to him, you too will soon have a drink out of the same cup from which he is drinking. And so it goes on. Horrible, horrible, cruel uh, events um, in which uh, Ivan seems to uh, have at least on one occasion directly participated. Over 116 victims were killed on that day. In strange and ingenious ways, ribs torn out, others flayed alive, some uh, impaled. And uh, in one case, Ivan ran through an individual with a spear, then stabbed the person 16 times and had him beheaded. And after four hours of this, uh, Ivan finally left the, uh, the, the scene of the horrors and uh, the Russian historian A.A. Zimin said the Russian capital had seen many horrors in its time but what happened in Moscow on 25th of July in its cruelty and sadistic refinement outdid all that had gone before and perhaps uh, can be explained only by the cruel temperament and the sick imagination of Ivan the Terrible. And this question of how do you explain the terrible, terrible violence of Ivan the Terrible is uh, a common and difficult theme in his life. It is clearly partly rage, uh, it would seem. It's partly terror, a uh, palsy of terror, I guess. Uh, and it is, uh, but it's also happening in a world where torture and violence is hardly unknown in parts of the world outside of Russia. <laughs> Think again, the St. Barthol. Bartholomew's massacre, think again about the tortures of the Spanish Inquisition, uh, let alone any other place uh, in, in the world. But this violence and terror strikes the heart of uh, trying to make sense of Ivan, because there is a, I guess, a tradition in uh, the history that builds on the previous ideas of state building and um, central building a centralized state and Ivan's early reforms that tries to make sense of what he did in the Oprichnina and his massive violence uh, and explain it as um, fighting with the boyars or fighting with the sort of uppity parts of the Russian territories like Novgorod, which still had these traditions of independence, or fighting with the church or fighting with the elites who he had to rely on, but who he just wanted to get rid of all the politics of and just in assert his own absolute will. It's what makes uh, Ivan's life so difficult uh, to explain because it is, it is, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's actions at the extreme and simple rational explanations in terms of political rivalries or social tensions doesn't quite seem to quite cut it. Indeed, there are some interpretations of Ivan's action as a uh, extreme case of an ideology of sacred kingship. And both what Ivan did in some of the cultish actions of the uh, Oprichnina, as well as some of those spectacular executions and acts of cruelty, as well as some of the private cruelty he seemed to practice in various uh, places, was a kind of a representation of uh, divine judgment being exercised by Ivan on the people of Russia, of those who had um, not adequately followed the faith. And again, uh, yes, it's extreme, but let's think of the extraordinary violence and horrors of 
uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation uh, Europe at this time as well. But uh, Bogotaref certainly says that the uh, Sergei Bogotaref from the uh, Cambridge History of Russia, Volume 1, said that the idea that Ivan acted as an exclusive judge, treating his subjects with awe and mercy like God, may explain why the Oprichnina policy was a peculiar combination of bloody terror and acts of public reconciliation. And uh, curiously enough, there's also a funny little connection there with Count Dracula. Uh, just to go on a bit of a side tangent, but it's not an entirely side tangent because... I guess there were certainly spectacular events, but also Ivan's Ivan's actions became, you know, the tabloid news across Europe throughout the 16th century, and uh, stories of his actions were perhaps also exaggerated, even perhaps by some of those European mercenary figures who wrote up the accounts of Ivan, and... Uh, they were in part explicitly written up uh, in uh, with tropes of Dracula or Vlad Tepes or Tepesh Dracul, who was a, a Wallachian or Wallachian prince who invaded Transylvania in around about 1460 and. There's some evidence that uh, Ivan uh, knew and read and learnt about many of the stories uh, that spread across Europe uh, about Count Vlad Tepes Dracul uh, and the various atrocities he committed uh, in uh, Hungary, etc. in the 15th century. Uh, and... Uh, Isabella de Mar Madariaga said that the invention of printing made the reproduction of tales of Dracul's real or imaginary atrocities into the best-selling horror stories of the age in the German-speaking world. And of course, I guess we know the story of Dracula these days, largely from the uh, 19th century retelling and then the Hollywood retelling of the story by uh, Bram Stoker from the late uh, 19th century, but indeed the story preceded that. And uh, perhaps, even perhaps in Ivan's own mind, he became something of a, 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 a sort of a mythic, mythic story of, you know, violent cruelty acting as the judgment of God that he... Uh, he, he played out in his own life, or perhaps some of his uh, uh, foreign visitors saw in his own life. Um, but again, there's also that quality of the sheer car carnivalesque theatrical violence uh, in the way in which Ivan uh, engaged in these various ceremonies. Uh, it's 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 one of the aspects of Ivan's life that is in his history that is you know difficult and forbidding to look at, but uh, and challenging to fit into interpretations of history. I think ultimately it's hard to or difficult to easily fit in such one suspects clearly emotionally driven violence into some uh, orderly, rational explanation. Uh, it is uh, part of the enigma of Ivan. And then we get to Ivan's mind, and clearly uh, one explanation of the violence is just to say that he was uh, evil, or he was a psycho, or he, a psycho killer, uh, or he uh, suffered some kind of mental illness. Uh, and we discussed, or I discussed last time, how he had a pretty traumatic childhood. <laughs> he would have uh, 
had a pretty suspicious mind and he certainly uh, was for decades worried about uh, keeping himself and his dynasty, his family and his state safe from various enemies, whether they were uh, domestic, uh, boyars or foreigners or uh, boyars acting with foreigners or whether they were enemies uh, created by his own febrile imagination. Uh, and again, it's hard to know uh, with some of the stories whether they are truly true um, or whether they are later constructions to try to make sense of this uh, strange and difficult person. For example, there are accounts of his personal uh, participation in torture and horrors and cultish sort of uh, like a kind of a weird sort of religious cult that he established with the Oprichnina at uh, Alexandra Sloboda. So uh, Albert Schlichting, who I think uh, we might have even quoted earlier on, was one of the foreign mercenaries, mercenaries who were part of the uh, uh, Oprichniki and he wrote a kind of a best-selling horror story afterwards uh, so perhaps one should be uh, skeptical of this but in that he talked about how the Tsar would visit the dungeons and the tyrant habitually watches with his own eyes those who are being tortured and put to death Thus it happens frequently that blood spurts onto his face. He is not in the least disturbed by the blood, but on the contrary, he is exhilarated by it and shouts exultantly, Hurrah, hurrah, or goya, goya. And then all those around him shout, Goya, goya. But whenever the tyrant observes someone standing there in silence, he immediately suspects that he is sympathetic to the prisoner and asks why he is sad when he should be joyful and then, and then orders him to be cut to pieces. And every day people are killed at his orders. So, could be true could be just a piece of uh, ghoulishness, but there's certainly other evidence to suggest that uh, Ivan certainly killed a lot of people. And in this weird, weird environment, there's this extraordinary story uh, that's told by some of the some of the accounts that he surrounded himself with madness and evil and debauchery and violence uh, all through the day but then uh, understandably at night and here we read from uh, Ivan the Terrible by Robert Payne and Nikita Romanov understandably he did not sleep well and we are told that he had to be coaxed to sleep by storytellers they were three blind men who recited fables and ancient histories until at last he fell into a fitful sleep. He also kind of believed he was a dread angel. He um, had a very religious cast of mind and saw himself in some ways as responsible for the salvation of the people. Perhaps... Madariaga spe speculates he even believed that he was the enactor of the judgment of doomsday the you know the sort of uh, the day of judgment the strazny sud in uh, in Russian doomsday where he would purify the world from sin uh, as its ultimate judge and bring a cleansing destructiveness uh, to the world. His mind, whether it was sane or not, was full of these ideas of sacred violence as well as a deep paranoia and this extraordinary um, these extraordinary religious overtones and theatricality.
he even wrote well he even wrote some songs of of repentance of being the dread angel uh, my own theory for what it's worth is that i suspect ivan of course one can never really know this hundreds of years uh, later but i suspect ivan had a personality disorder there is of course a huge literature in forensic psychiatry and forensic psychology these days some of which i for work was uh, had to uh, get quite intimate with uh, a few years ago and some of of ivan's actions struck me as not so uh, as as consistent with a description of a borderline or or antisocial personality disorder and in part perhaps that also explains some of this enigma because he was never quite like full raging mad he wasn't like psychotic it was more uh he, he didn't necessarily lose his reason but he had a a willingness to break normal moral boundaries i guess in the service of the uh, obsessive ideas that he followed and a a um complete ruthlessness in the actions that he took uh, in terms of uh, violence uh examples of of um uh, factors and backgrounds on the violent personality childhood victimization attachment deficits poor empathy witnessing parental violence narcissism disregard for social norms tendency for aggression history of animal abuse and animal cruelty promiscuity hostility to women impulsivity other other things so i it's just a theory but that's my theory that ivan most likely had a personality disorder and this personality disorder was put in this extraordinary situation where his personal beliefs about his uh indomitable will were uh supported by the institution in which he lived and uh the apparent success of his early years um, but it seriously undid him in the end and that brings us to the theme of repentance and death and yeah one of the fascinating things about ivan is that that those uh constant um expressions of repentance such as the the uh, quote with which we started the show alas for me a sinner woe to me in my despair O oh, me in my foulness it behoves you our masters to illuminate us who have lost our way in the darkness of pride who are mired in sinful vanity gluttony and intemperance and i a stinking hound whom can i teach what can i preach and with what can i enlighten others myself always wallowing in drunkenness fornication adultery filth murders rapine despoliation hatred and all sorts of evil doing he certainly uh, had some insight into his behavior let's say he did not uh, he did not deny the fact that he did these horrible things he was deeply repentant for them indeed uh, Isabel de Martariaga points out that poems of repentance Stiki Pokeyanye in uh, Russian uh, were a major cultural phenomenon uh, literary form in the 15th and 16th centuries in Russia uh, and they were sung as hymns during fasts on uh, themes and talked about the evanescence and sinfulness of mortal men they prepared the soul for the passage to the next world uh, and an example 
uh, she gives, which probably shaped the mental world of Ivan, is this one. Adam wept tears sitting outside paradise. Paradise, my paradise. Oh, my beautiful paradise. For me, paradise were you created. And because of Eve, you were closed. Woe to me, a sinner. Woe to me for not listening. I have sinned, Lord, I have sinned. And I disobeyed the command. No more shall I see the heavenly food, nor hear the voices of archangels. I have sinned, Lord, I have sinned, gracious God. Have mercy on a fallen man. And, of course, the the ultimate expression of that uh, repentance of Ivan in his last years was the deep grief after his uh, son uh, was killed, died, and his preparation of the uh, synoptiki, which were the lists of all the people who he had killed in his uh, torrents of cruelty, uh, whose names were read out in church, and who uh, he expressed his deep regret for. And that image of a man aware and incredibly regretful and repentant for his cruelty and his madness and his horrors and all the terrors he's performed uh, seems to me superbly captured in the great painting by Repin of or Repin of uh, Ivan the Terrible uh, after killing his son, the, the staff used to strike him fallen on the ground and the, the, the dead son in his arms. And Ivan's face is just a sheer expression of horror and terror at uh, perhaps his fate in the future world, this man who had believed he was the dread angel uh, purifying the world from sin, now saw himself as likely to be purified from the world uh, for all his sins. It's an extraordinary image, uh, extraordinary painting, and it captures so well his uh, his. Uh, his uh, death, he, he, his repentance before his death. And I guess finally, I guess there is that final mystery about his death as well, which I spoke about briefly last time with Jerome Halsey's weird little comment that uh, Ivan was strangled and stark dead. Uh, and there has been quite a bit of speculation about how this broken man uh, who had so many enemies, who had brought his country to such ruin, whether he in fact uh, died a natural death. And here, if I just uh, quote from Andre Pavlov and Maureen uh, Perry's book, Ivan the Terrible, uh, another of uh, fine books, slightly less uh, beautifully written, I think, than uh, Isabel de Mandariaga's slightly less humanly compassionate perhaps than hers but still a fine book and she talks about the strange account of Ivan's death on 18th of March 1584 provided by Jerome Horsey where Ivan learned that the soothsayers were foretelling his death for that Day fell into a rage and then spent some time in the bath before sitting down to play chess with one of his courtiers and with Bogdan Belsky and uh, Boris Godunov uh, standing nearby. Then the Tsar fainted and fell backwards. A commotion ensure, ensued. They sent for alcohol and for the confessor and the physicians. And in the meantime, Horsey wrote, 
he was strangled and stark dead. Now, Pavlov and Maureen Perry comment that clearly, this clearly hinted that uh, Ivan suffered a violent death. And some later writers, the author of the Novgorod Chronicle, the secretary Ivan Tomofev, the Dutchman Isaac Massa, and others report that Ivan Grozny was poisoned by Bogdan Belsky and Boris Godunov, and these sources reflect widespread contemporary rumours that Tsar Ivan did not have a natural death. He was, I guess, mid-50s. He'd led a pretty wild life. Uh, but uh, mid-50s, as Tsar was perhaps not um, uh, all that old, some historians also accept the version that he was murdered by Belsky and Godunov. But these authors comment it is unlikely that Ivan's death would have been in the interests of Godunov and especially Belsky, who owed their careers to the Tsar's patronage and their service at his court. Which is why I imagine that perhaps one of the captured Skomoroki from Novgorod who had long served uh, in a servile way, Ivan finally, finally had enough and strangled Ivan uh, in his bath or his bed and used his intimacy to um, exact his own revenge against the uh, repression of his art by power. But that is a story for another day. Perhaps the role of a off-stage character is the only way to explain this act. That there was a natural death, but it was none of the known uh, powerful players. It was an individual pursuing a personal agenda uh, amidst a, uh, against a uh, very difficult man. Finally, let's talk about Ivan's legacy. And wow, it's, you know, I guess I've already talked a bit about the significant role in shaping the, the black legend of Russian history and the devastation he left of uh, Russia, which in a way helped drive the or, or help create the conditions for the uh, time of troubles and the social catastrophe of Russia's first civil war. And it's also worth commenting that Ivan very was a very strong presence in Russian popular memory, perhaps not surprising. Uh, some of his uh, and and some of that presence in popular memory and folk tales is relatively uh, positive towards Ivan. He he is seen as uh, I guess strengthening the Russian state and uh, acting on behalf of the people a little bit like the account of the massacre of uh, that was given by that foreign mercenary, the massacres in Moscow. Uh, there was also a, uh, uh, for example, uh, a tale of the merchant of Kaharadhon Balulan who witnessed the massacres in Moscow and resisted the Tsar and um, stories of his legendary resistance to that. So uh, he plays a enormous role in uh, Russian, I guess, folk culture. He similarly is a very powerful presence in the uh, Russian literary traditions. They were clearly like there were some significant historical novels, uh, like some of the first historical novels in Russia in the uh, 19th century uh, written about Ivan the Terrible and then, of course, also the Time of Troubles. It's a really critical set of events in the story and I guess as we've learned over this two-part episode it is just 
uh, wow, such material for no- novels and stories. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, and he, even today, uh, there is a contemporary Russian novelist, uh, Vladimir Thorkin, uh, who wrote a book called, or a novel called The Day of the Oprichnik, uh, which sort of imagines a future Russia, even perhaps a contemporary Russia that is ruled by a cruel tyrant and with a, a new form of terror being implemented, a kind of corrupt kleptocratic terror. So the legend of Ivan the Terrible is even to this day being rewritten to uh, relate itself to contemporary Russian events. In film and in art, there are some, you know, iconic images like that painting by Repin, and of course the film, famous film by Sergei Eisenstein, uh, prepared under the watchful eye of Joseph Stalin about Ivan the Terrible. And uh, perhaps though, of course, most significantly for the Burning Archive, there is a complex, complex a historiographical or, or legacy of interpretation of uh, Ivan's role in Russian history. Isabella de Madariaga comments in her final summary chapter of Ivan's legacy to Russia that the confusion which still exists over the interpretation of Ivan's reign provides one of the most obvious examples of the nefarious influence of ideology over historical writing. The portrayal of Ivan's reign has been distorted almost from the very beginning. And this is a complicated history, uh, which we won't, but we have discussed it to some degree. And certainly in uh, the West and the Anglo-American world, that historical interpretation continues to be influenced by the uh, legacy of the Cold War and the reinterpretation of Ivan as a kind of a proto-Stalin, proto-authoritarian terror state, and indeed uh, uh, by of the interpretation of Vladimir Putin as the continuation of that dark Russian tradition. How do we sum up Ivan's legacy to Russia? Sergei Bogatyrev asked the question, was Ivan's reign important in a long-term perspective? The traditional view is that Ivan created a centralized state which assumed control over its subjects through the political regime of autocracy. Recent studies with their accent on Continuities, localities, minorities, and informal relations within the elite argue that Ivan's regime remained medieval and personal. Ivan and his advisers did indeed use some traditional forms of dynastic and court policies. It is also clear now that the social and political structure of the Muscovite polity under Ivan never was as homogeneous as the notion of a centralized state implies. Nevertheless, Bogotarev says, Ivan changed Muscovy. The royal family became more important, the dynasty was strengthened, the monarchy became more powerful, uh, the elite became more organized, and a whole series of reforms were introduced to the court, the chancery, local administration that, he says, facilitated the functioning of the military fiscal state. Not so different to parallel reforms occurring uh, across, well, certainly across Europe, even perhaps across Eurasia. But whatever his policies, his approach was extravagant and unpredictable, almost certainly affected by his uh, personality disorder. So he did reform 
the Russian state, but he left to his successors, Bogotarov says, a devastated but coherent state that retained its territorial integrity even in spite of the stormy events of the time of troubles. As a result of Ivan's rules, Muscovy became a self-sufficient polity at an immensely high price. However, he did not define the future of Russian history. He did not embody the essence of the Russian autocratic soul. And yet, he is one of those extraordinary figures in Russian history, in world history, really, who are right at the sort of limit of both what we can understand about the role of an individual in history, the role of violence and madness and rationality in history, uh, the exercise of power, uh, the, 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 the interpenetration of uh, a complex psychology with a powerful state and a symbol of power itself. Eva, uh, Isabel de Madariaga says, his reign is a tragedy of Shakespearean proportions. And uh, ultimately, it is the unique and extraordinary stories and the tragedies and the wonder of all that, which, um, you know, accounts for his fascination and the ongoing attempts to understand him. But uh, if you're going to do that, uh, do pay attention to some of the, uh, the complex and wonderful work that has been done in recent years, including Isabella de Madariaga's biography of Ivan that uh, draws him away from legend and myth and bad rumour and uh, repetitions of accounts of Count Dracula and uh, Joseph Stalin and dictators of the world and looks at him as a very complex individual uh, in very uh, unique circumstances, but yet who had some similarities with other Eurasian princes and even princesses of the 16th century. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this extensive discussion of Ivan the Terrible, his extraordinary life uh, and times, and I will uh, include in the kind of show notes on the old birdingarchive.com website the some of the material that you can check out if you are interested in Ivan the Terrible and his extraordinary life and the extraordinary difficulty of interpreting what all happened in his life and um, I'm going to be back next week with the next episode which is looking at the the Tatar or Mongol yoke uh, that period in uh, in Russian history where it's the Mongol Empire which uh, is really in charge of many of uh, the Russian states, most of all, all the Russian states, and that actually has a very significant influence on Russian history, even if uh, there has been contradictory views around that over time. Is it uh, the Mongol yoke, or is it, as Marie Favreau says in her recent book, The Horde, the Mongol exchange and that's what we'll be looking at next week in the meantime do like and subscribe leave us a positive review on iTunes you can subscribe to the Burning Archive YouTube channel where some of this material will go up uh, eventually once I put it in video form and uh, you can also uh, support me and the show by uh, buying my uh, new book from the Burning Archive from Amazon or 
any other online book retailer. Okay, thanks for listening. Until next time, do remember what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee.